the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. Shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. Shout out your praise. this morning. Amen. Hey, you may be seated. Thanks so much for being here this morning. I want to say welcome. Welcome to Spring Creek. We're glad that you're worshiping with us today. And maybe you're a guest in the house or you've been a guest for a couple of weeks. We want to say thanks for being here. We'd love to get connected with you, to welcome you, to get to know you, and give you a free specialty drink to our city coffee located right around the corner. We have some incredible family hosts who are located in the lobby wearing red lanyards who would love to greet you and give you that free drink, get to know you, and say thanks for being here. Hey, we've got a student missions team in Zambia today. You're going to see some photos. We're celebrating what God is doing in and through them there. We're so glad that he's using them, and they're building a tabernacle that was paid for by your generous giving during our Rescue Global back in February, so thank you so much. Maybe you see those photos and you said, hey, I want to be in one of those photos. I want to go to Zambia. You know, our heart is to come alongside the Zambia Assemblies of God there and to help them fulfill their dream of putting a tabernacle 
within walking distance of every Zambian. And so we've been in a two-year uh, uh, drive with that. We're going to go three and, and more if the Lord has us, but we're excited to be there. If you're interested in going on a trip, we're going in October, the end of October. We'd love to invite you to our interest meeting that we're having on July 19th in our East Room, which is located next to the Fellowship Hall. Come, hear what it's like, what we're doing, what does it take to get there. If you come to that meeting, it's not committing, you're just getting uh, acquainted with what's going on. We'd love to see you there. You know, we couldn't do that and a lot of other things without the generosity and faithfulness as you give the Lord's tithes and offerings. We want to say thank you for doing that. Thank you for helping us fulfill the mission that we have as a church to rescue lost people, redeem families, and raise up leaders here on, on this campus, outside the walls of this church, and around the world, and, and in Zambia as well. So thank you so much for your generosity. Our three prayer points this morning that we're praying for, our missionaries are Blake and Katie Edgman to Ireland, and in fact, they're in the house today. You're going to hear from them in a few moments. We're excited to have them. We're praying for Edmund Crossings Community Church. We're thankful for that church in our city. And then we're also praying for our Edmund Police Department. So would you stand to your feet this morning? Let's lift up our voices in unison together. Father God, we thank you so much that you have allowed us to be in your house today with your people as we sing your praises, as we hear the word, as we connect with people. God, it is a holy day and we give it to you. Father, we thank you for uh, the generosity of the people of this church. God, we thank you as you're leading us to give. God, on various levels as we follow you, what does it look like to, to worship you through our giving, through our tithes and offerings, through missions giving, above and beyond? We thank you for that. Father, we pray that you would bless it, that you would multiply Apply, that you would help us to be good stewards of it as we do fulfill that mission through the giving. God, we thank you so much for Blake and Katie and what they're doing in Ireland, their commitment there, their yes there, and how you're using them and have been using them. We pray that you would continue to do that. Father, we lift up also to you today, Crossings Community Church. We thank you for this church that's in our city that's doing great things to preach the gospel, to bring hope and, and share life with others. We pray for their pastor, their congregation, their leadership team, God. Go before them and be with them and help them fulfill their specific and unique mission that you've given them. And then, Father, we pray for our police department here in Edmond. God, we thank you for the incredible officers and detectives and staff that we have who have given their lives to serve the citizens of the city, to protect, to keep safe. And, Father, we pray for those officers and detectives that are represented as moms and dads and sons and daughters and brothers and sisters. We just pray protection over them, give them a safe uh, nights and day shifts. God, and we thank you for what they do as they say yes to serving our city. Father, we give the rest of this time to you as we enter back into worship. God, I pray that our hearts would be open. Lord, that our ears would be attuned to you speaking to us. God, may we be changed and transformed in your presence today. We value that. And we say, have your way. And it's in your name we pray. Everybody said. Amen. I'm going to invite our prayer partners to come forward. We believe in the power of prayer. So if you have something that you would like somebody to partner with you in prayer over, or maybe you want to stand in for somebody who needs a move of God, we would love to pray with you this morning as we continue to worship.
confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We thank you that that is real here 
but it's also real in Zambia today among our team. And Lord, we just praise you for the opportunity to open doors you've given our church to partner with the beautiful people of Zambia. Today, Father, we thank you for this team that sacrificed and put their funds together, worked hard, and traveled many, many hours to experience life change in another country. And today, Lord, we pray memorable moments, God moments for this team. We ask, Lord, that you would surround them, that you would provide everything that they need, Lord, in protection, in relationship building, in the resources of strength and health, sustainability, Lord, and bring them back to us safely, we ask. All in the name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody said amen. Well, speaking of what God is doing around the world, it's a real honor to share a moment with some missionaries. So you can be seated just for a moment. It's a real joy to have our missionaries with us. Anytime we get to have global workers with us that we support on a monthly basis, super, super important. And even in a summer crowd like this, to bring them to us is just really critical. Just to help us know, January through December, we are a missions church. So I want you to just give your full attention to this family today. We've got Blake, Katie, Eden, and Eli with us. They're the Edgemans, and they serve in Ireland. Anybody want to go to Ireland? Yeah. Uh, we brought them some weather that's very accommodating, right? All of this rain that they get in Ireland, uh, they got it today. Well, there are Oklahoma missionaries, a part of our missionary team here, and they're serving a very unique ministry in Ireland called Zoe Community. It's a crisis pregnancy outreach, and it's unbelievable. So would you give a Spring Creek welcome to Blake and Katie Edgman today? <laughs> Guys, it's so awesome to have you here. Consider you personal friends as well as colleagues in the great work of the Lord and what you're doing in Ireland that's just super special so tell us about Zoe community what in the world is Zoe community well Zoe is an organization that trains volunteers from local churches to support women in crisis pregnancy so these are women who from lots of different walks of life some stay-at-home moms we have an accountant we have an engineer um, a lot of ladies who wouldn't normally be able to reach out on their own or have the training for that, but we give them a means to do that. Wow, that's amazing. And you guys have been serving in Ireland and the Lord has developed a lot of ministries and this is the newest one and it's groundbreaking for Ireland. As much as we partner with Hope Pregnancy Center here in Edmond, we get to also partner with this crisis pregnancy center, this outreach ministry, and it's just so amazing. So what exactly are you endeavoring to do? I mean, the impact, I'm sure you've got something in mind, but when it comes to the grace of God working through your guys, what's the idea of an impact we're talking about here? Right. Well, like we, in fact, do you have your phone? Yeah, we got a text. This is sort of a visualization of the impact that we feel God wants to, to have in Ireland. Um, so we got a text from one of the therapists who works with us, and she saw a lady who was pregnant, and this lady sent her a text, and if you don't mind, yeah, that's her little baby, this lady. She sent this text to our volunteer, and she said, thought, um, I'm so happy that Zoe Community helped me. I can't believe how much love I feel for this baby already. I'm glad I made the decision to stay pregnant. So wow. I thought that was so cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, praise God. And we know God wants to multiply that times a thousand. Yeah. So. That's so beautiful. And God put this in your heart, Katie. And Blake said, listen, how can we make this happen? And you guys have worked so beautifully together as a family to see this become a reality. And indeed it is just by those kind of testimonies. So we praise the Lord for that. So we're all about the tangibility of this, right? So how can we practically help fund this 
in your ministry as well as prayerfully support you along the way. Yeah, so, I mean, be praying for us because we have a women's conference coming up in September. It's the first one we've ever done, and uh, the momentum is pretty intense. It's grown on us, so it's a lot to carry, but pray for us because God's opening door after door for that, and we continue to train volunteers. We're waiting for charity status still. I'm pretty sure we've said that every time we've come here, (laughs) but we're at the last stage, which I think we've said that every time we've come here too, but I think we actually are. But we are, we are here in the States trying to raise $5,000 so we can increase our, our locations. So we have three locations. We have one in South Dublin where we live, one in city center Dublin, and one in a town called Drogheda. And these are places where volunteers can meet women who are in crisis. Yeah. And so the one in, D- in Dublin where we lived is the most busy. That's our headquarters. That's where we're planning this conference. We're training volunteers. We're doing all kinds of stuff. And we're doing that simultaneously trying to have therapy in this space. And it's not all that conducive. Yeah. So we want to get a second office right in our little office space, like the next door office in this building. So that way we can have a, an exclusive place for people like this. Beautiful. And the cool thing about this, it's such a beautiful partnership, is when you guys give and when you guys pray, you're doing this. We sang that earlier, even when you don't see it, you're working. And, and I just imagine this baby who is now going to be a baby and going to be a life and they're going to have kids and they're going to have kids and you Spring Creek have played a generational part in an entire string of generation will move because you've been giving you've provided that space and you you help save a baby and there's thousands to come so that's that's what we need partnership with thank you Edmonds for answering the call thank you for being willing to pick up the normal way of life and put it aside and say, let's do something different for God, hearing God's voice and just following that, raising your boys in Ireland. That's got to be an interesting challenge and journey, but you guys are doing so well. Eden and Eli are some handsome dudes, and you guys are doing extremely well as parents and pray blessings on your marriage and all that God's called you to do. Church, I want to invite you to join Michelle and I to give above and beyond the tithe today. Uh, I want I want to give them a $5,000 gift from our church. And so uh, that's enabled by your generous giving in this summer crowd on all three of our services. So I'm just going to invite you to dig deep and you can do that online today. You can drop something in the buckets or the boxes on the back and uh, you can drop it by the church, however the Lord leads you. But if you would feel so inclined to join Michelle and I and say, Let's do something big here. Let's make a difference. How many believes that Spring Creek's been called to make a difference? Amen? Amen? Well, we're going to pray for you guys. Come on up here. I'm going to invite you to stand all over the place and stretch your hands this way. Father, we thank you today for Blake and Katie, Eden and Eli. Thank you for raising them up many years ago. Lord, they had no idea what you would be doing with their life right here and right now, but Father, you did. You always have a design and what you originate, you orchestrate. And Father, we're believing that you're putting it all together. I pray, Lord, that every door you open for them, the funding will be there. Lord, the anxiety will not be there. The confidence will be there. I pray, Father, you would protect them and and give them favor, anoint their connections, make level paths for their feet. Lord, I just thank you that this Zoe community will be known far and wide, a place of hope, healing, redemption. Lord, right there in, in Ireland, we're rescuing lost people, redeeming the family and raising up leaders. And we thank you for that privilege through the Edmonds. Bless them today in their marriage and in their family. Keep them healthy and strong, we pray. In the, the mighty name of Jesus, we pray these things. Everybody said amen. Amen. Come on, give them a good hand again. Group hug. Love you guys so, so much. Appreciate you. Well, remain standing as we go into this continuation of a tremendous teaching series entitled Summer on the Mount. We invite you to grab those worship guides in a moment as you're seated. Take notes. 
but we have a custom of reading God's Word out loud. And today we're at verse 8, walking through the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5. I believe that the Beatitudes that are known here in this passage of Scripture summarizes all five, six, and seven chapters of this what's called Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gave those many years ago. Verse 8 today is a powerful truth, and I want us to read this verse out loud. It's on the screen in front of you, so let's read it together. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. Say it again. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. Now, we believe, Lord, that you're going to speak to us personally as well as corporately. We thank you for the power of your word. We submit ourselves to its work today. Customize this word in all of our hearts. We pray, Father, in Jesus' name, not only would we be inspired by what we hear, but transformed by the power of the word of God. And we praise you for that. We honor it and we honor you, Lord. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you so very much. Well, today we're talking about a deeper matter, a deeper matter. I've been privileged to play some pretty remarkable and exquisite golf courses in America, not because I'm good, but because I have some really cool friends. And on one occasion, when I knew I would be playing on this particular golf course, I went shopping. And I was like, I'm going to look good. How many knows that some people need more help than others? Well, I'm one of those. And so I went out and I got me a new hat. I got me a new shirt. I got me a new pair of slacks. I had my golf shoes and my bag, and they all had the same brand. And I felt like I was like ready for the magazine front cover of Golf Exquisites. And I walked out and I met some of my buddies and one of the guys said, man, you're looking really good today. I hope your golf matches that. How many knows it probably did not, <laughs> right? The scripture says to us today that God blesses those whose hearts are pure. Pure, this word pure in the Greek has two meanings, made clean and congruent, made clean and congruent. Here's the point. We can dress the part without playing it well. We can dress the part without playing it well. So this is what I want you to remember this morning, and I'm going to unpack this throughout the entire teaching. Biblical purity is living Christ-empowered congruence. Biblical purity is living in Christ empowered congruence. What happens in our relationships when we're living a double life? Not good, is it? What happens on the job when we aren't being honest with what we claim to be and who we really are? Not good, huh? There's a lot of duplicity in the world, and we're injured all the more because of it. Our marriages don't make it in duplicity. Our jobs aren't successful when we're living a double standard or a double life. Scripture tells us here that we are blessed or we're in need of nothing when we are pure in heart and the promise, the prophetic promise is that we're going to see God. And we're going to unpack all of this, but I believe understanding that biblical purity knowing that it makes us clean inside and congruent, it brings us to a new, fresh revelation that the way we live should match what we profess. And our confession and our character must be in congruence, should be, and is meant to be. 
And the Holy Spirit gives us all the tools necessary to make that happen. The world needs those who are living out Christ empowered congruence. I believe when we come to these points of teaching here in this part of the Sermon on the Mount, we're seeing how these characteristics are meant to impact our relationships. And we know that when we're living in congruence, that's a good impact. When we're not, we're in bad shape with our relationships. I believe what the Lord is saying here is that my kingdom will be characterized by people who not only confess Christ as Lord, but live that confession out every single day. And they will see God. They will see God. I'm going to check this out with me in J James chapter 4, verse 8. It's a real kind of rebuking verse, but it helps us to understand what this pure in heart business means. Come close to God, James says, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Probably the most injuring testimony that we can have as the church is when we don't have a pure testimony. But our testimony brings a mixed message. Like, you tell me that this is a church of love, but you don't really love real well. How many of that's not a good testimony, right? Or you believe in God's holiness, but... Your life doesn't look real holy or you don't act real holy, right? So we're going to understand that James is kind of saying exactly what Jesus was saying, but in a very different way when he said that when you are living pure in heart, understanding it, boy, did those hearers understand it. Like these people sitting on the mountainside when Jesus is teaching, they're like getting the message like, okay, you got our attention when you said pure in heart and see in God. Because if it was ever anything in the Jewish mind, it was about external realities and requirements. They understood what it meant to externally be pure, customarily be pure. And seeing God, that was nothing you could do because even Moses, the great Moses, couldn't see God, right? Not his face. And yet, here is the testimony of Jesus saying, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. What in the world is that all about? Well, what Jesus is saying is, you give your heart and your life wholly to me, I'll make you holy. You give your heart and your life wholly to me, I'll make you holy. Well, that's a good deal, isn't it? I like to say it like this, holy his equals holiness. When we're completely surrendered to him, when he has our heart, when he has our affections, when he has our attitudes, when he has all of us, he's going to make somebody holy up in here. He's going to get his way in our life. Now, before you think moving forward in this teaching that purity is provided by what we do, <laughs> you've missed the whole point of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to reemphasize what this Sermon on the Mount was all about, emphasizing here, blessed are the poor in, are the pure in heart. Let's review what the Sermon on the Mount is. The Sermon on the Mount is a message to you and me, not to scholars, not to theologians, but everyday followers, you and me, who are endeavoring to follow Jesus. What does that look like? That's a message to you and me. Secondly, it's a description of God's kingdom life. You want to know what God's kingdom looks like? This is it right here. And then thirdly, it's a life we can't live without Jesus. So this is the big point the big idea of the Sermon on the Mount. You can't live godly without God. <laughs> you can't live righteously without Jesus. You can't know what it is to be free without the one who sets us free, without that relationship on the inside of us. So, yeah, this is a hillside of holy how-tos, but not how to live moral but how to live out morality, not how to get into the kingdom, but how to live the kingdom life once you're given the grace of God to enter it. So what do we need to know about biblical purity today? You know, I feel like when I'm reading this, I'm like, my goodness, it's been a long time since I talked about purity. 
I feel, I feel this challenge on the inside of me. It's certainly not a long time since I've dealt with purity in my own life because I, I deal with that every single day. So do you. But I think living this congruence is a big deal. And a lot of times what we endeavor to do is kind of paint the exterior and say, we're, we're good. We got it all together. Maybe some of you got into a fuss before you came to church today. And you were doing your best to keep it all together when you opened that car door in the church parking lot, waved at a friend, and acted like everything was all right before you wanted to kill somebody at home. You know what I'm talking about. Don't you wish that we could always be exactly what we profess to be? Well, we can with the help of God's Holy Spirit. I, I, I was... Uh, uh, we were having, Michelle and I were having dinner a couple of nights ago, and on our way inside the restaurant, I saw this father and this little girl really having a conference outside. And doubtfully, she was acting up on the inside of the restaurant, and they were having words. And she was yelling, I mean, running around yelling, don't beat me, Daddy, don't beat me. And this dad was like, oh, my word. <laughs> this is like the father's worst nightmare up in here, you know. Come on, sweetheart. Come on, get it together, baby. Let's go. I mean, it was that dad was ready to get that kid back into the restaurant, make sure everything was okay. The last thing we want is anybody to think we don't have it together. And so what do we do? We work so hard on the exterior. And the Lord says, let me work hard on the interior. Let me get something going on the inside of you. And so what do we need to know about biblical purity? Well, the first thing we need to know is that the heart will always be God's greatest concern. The heart will always be God's greatest concern. Blessed are the pure in heart. It's a description that Jesus is saying there. Blessed are the pure in heart, meaning blessed are the poor in spirit, not poverty, not like I don't have anything, but spiritually bankruptcy, spiritual bankruptcy. Same here. Blessed are the pure, not externally, but blessed are the pure in in heart. Everybody say heart. And I, I'm glad you've got one, but we're not talking about cardiac. We're not talking about emotions. We're talking about a deeper matter all together. We're talking about the place where desire, deliberation, and decisions are made. It's a place where the consciousness is alive and decisive in spiritual activity. The comprehensive term for a person's whole being, his feelings, desires, passions, thought, understanding, will, the center of a person, the place God is working. This has been the theme from early in Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation. We see it, but early on, even in narratives like David, when David was being chosen king, so the prophet Samuel goes to the house of Jesse, and Jesse has all of these sons. David is in the dealing with the sheep in the field, and he says, bring me out all your sons, and he misses David, and, and he's, he's looking at all these handsome guys tall, and, and Samuel says, oh, yeah, one of these dudes are going to be a great king, and then all of a sudden, there's a tap on Samuel's heart, I should say, and 1 Samuel 16, 7, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height for I've rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. It's the deeper matter to the core of human life. And see, the problem in that culture, in that day where Jesus was teaching, mere external observation of the law could easily bypass the more important purity of the heart. And so what was Jesus declaring? He was declaring that a pure heart is what produces external purity. Like, you want to do good? Let me do good on the inside of you. And if you let me do good on the inside of you, that's the only way you're going to do good any other time. And any other goodness is manufactured the heart will always be God's greatest concern. That's what we need to know about biblical purity. What else do we need to know about biblical purity? We need to know this, that trusting in anything other than Jesus is death. It's not just dangerous, it's death. 
If it's a matter of the heart, then it's a holy matter. If, if it's a deeper matter, then it's a divine matter. It's not external because if it was external, then we could slap on some makeup and we could do some really good things for people and, and we, can, we could work really hard, but at the end of the day, that's only surface deep. But what matters is what he's doing on the inside. And the only one who can do that is Jesus. And the only way we can embrace the kingdom life is Jesus. And the only way we're going to have clear focus is when we can see the cross in front of us every single day of our lives. Trusting in anything other than Jesus is death. I'm going to give you these words from J.I. Packer, and they're deep words, so I want you to listen to them, and I'll unpack it. This is what he says, the index of the soundness of a man's faith in Christ. In other words, the measure of his soundness in faith. Is it real or is it not real? Is based on the genuineness of the self-despair with which from which it springs. We'll read that again. The index of the soundness of a man's faith in Christ is the genuineness of the self-despair from which it springs. In other words, if you understand how utterly helpless you are and your eyes are on Jesus, that's how sound your faith in Christ really is. If you're trying to figure this out yourself, you're trying to work up something to please God, I think we are all there. I think when we deal with this heart issue and trusting God, sometimes we feel like we're trusting God, but in actuality, we're trusting some level of performance in our own life. And we're just talking a few moments ago, Katie was sharing just about one of her boys saying at some point in, in, in his childhood that he, was, he had a struggle and, and, and he looked up his mom and said, am I still good, mom? Am I still good? Am I, am I still a good boy? And I feel like that sometimes. I, I want to say to God, God, am I, am I still a good boy? Do, 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 am I still doing okay? Am I still doing all right? And, and, and if we can just remember that there is absolutely nothing more important than letting Jesus take control of our life, how many knows that that's the only goodness that can come from our life? That's the only goodness that can come from our life. In the early church narrative, we see this this remarkable turn of events, Jesus had been ascended into heaven and, and the early church is still powering on in the Holy Spirit. And Peter and John are at this gate called Beautiful. Michelle and I visited it when we were in Israel and it was at this gate, Beautiful, that a man was laying there lame and Peter and John come up to him and say, man, we don't have any silver, we don't have any gold. I know you're wanting money, but we're going to give you something more important than that. What we have, we give to you. Rise up and walk. And the man was healed. There were some religious leaders that were really ticked off by that. And so they come up and so they start questioning Peter and John and they say, all right, now, 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 how did you do that? And they, they said, we did that in the name of Jesus. Oh, here we go again, they said. I thought we killed that dude. And here you are still rolling and going on this name Jesus. And they got up, they felt courage enter their heart and they spoke out and this is what they spoke out in Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Can I tell you, church, that the same name that saved you is the same name that's going to keep you saved. The same name that saved you is the same name that's going to continue to inspire godly, righteous change in your life. And without Jesus, we can't do anything. Jesus said it in John chapter 15, verse 5, apart from him, we can do nothing. So come on, trusting in anything other than Jesus is not just dangerous, it's death. And we got to remember that. We got to hold on to that. And then what do we need to know? about biblical purity. Lastly, we need to know that there is nothing more important than God's presence now and forever. Nothing more important than God's presence now and forever. You say, why are you talking about God's presence? Well, because that's really what we're talking about. At the end of the day, he says, there's a great reward. There's a promise for those who let me work on their heart. And if you'll keep letting me work on your heart, you're going to see God. 
You're going to see God. If you continue to play the game, like the performance game, like not honest with me, like not being real with me, not being transparent with me, and try to just live this life on your own, your own strength, or blame it on something else without understanding that your heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure, who can understand it? Jeremiah 17, 9. If you don't, don't, don't grapple with that, I can't do anything in your life. But if you'll let me keep working on your heart, you're going to see God. And I'm going to tell you something. That was a promise of promises that spoke to eternal future, that spoke to a settlement of, of, of performance, a settlement of, of achievement, of requirement. It's like you're going to see God. Like the only way to see God is if you do this, 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 this. No, if you'll let me keep working on your heart, you're going to see God. You're going to see God. And when we talk about God's presence now and forever, that's really what we're talking about, the whole benefit of living under the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. This is what we know. That when I call the doctor and I say, I want to see Dr. Smith, that's who I want to see. I want to see Dr. Smith. I don't want to see the nurse. I don't want to see the nurse practitioner. I don't want to see another doctor. I want to see Dr. Smith. Why do I want to see Dr. Smith? Because Dr. Smith knows my case. He's got my file if he wants to see it. But he understands me. He's been working on me for a long time. He understands the ins and outs of me. He knows what's been bothering me. He knows where my ailments are. He knows the, the, the fragments that are, that are going on. He knows me. And I want to see Dr. Smith. What am I saying is I want to have a face-to-face encounter with the doctor. I don't want to see anybody else. So it's access. It's availability. It's, it's getting into his presence. Let me tell you something. When we enter that day on the other side of time called eternity, we're going to be face-to-face with the God who knows us, who doesn't have to look at a file, just look at a name. It's in the Lamb's Book of Life. You're good to go. He's going to know beyond a shadow of a doubt what we've been struggling with, what we've attempted to hide but couldn't and gave it to him. He's going to know how long he's been working on us. He's going to know what it took to get us to where we are. And he is going to say, come on in. Well done, good and faithful servant. Not because you did well, but because you allowed me to keep working on your heart. Come on, church. There is nothing more important than God's presence now and forever. Listen to the words of 1 John 3, 2, and 3. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. In other words, we haven't got all this figured out. This, is, this, this whole eternity thing is still a mystery. But we do know <laughs> that we will be like him. For we will see him. Shout, we will see him. Come on, shout, we will see him. For we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. There's something far more important than anybody else's presence in our life. And that's us recognizing, not without you, Lord. Not without you and my waking up and my lying down. And that same presence I feel I'm going to experience forever in eternity, never have to ask for it, never have to plead for it, but to be in your presence will be the reward. But he wants you to feel his presence now. He wants you to know who he is today. This is what I know about sin. Can I just talk about sin for a moment? Is that okay? Because sin affects our ability to even perceive God's presence in our life, hear his voice. Sometimes when we have cherished sin or undealt with sin in our life, we're unable to perceive what his will is for us, what he wants us to do. I like what one writer says, purity leads to clarity. When we're willing to let him work in our heart, that's the deeper matter. But we slide back, and when we slide back, we lose sight. And we lose sight, we slide back. We got to keep our eyes on the goal to see God, to hear well done, to experience the reward of being in his presence now and forever. 
Can I talk to you about what separates us from God? Can I talk to you about what we need to deal with on a daily basis? The world, the flesh, the devil. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not here to preach against anything as much as I'm here, I'm here to preach for the grace of God, the cross, the blood, redemption, the work of God in Christ. Just don't misunderstand what I'm saying here because I know that we have a tendency to listen to certain songs and we have a tendency to watch certain things and open ourselves up to certain experiences. Listening to a song with secular or sexual suggestive lyrics won't cause you to run to the internet and start downloading pornography. Watching a movie with certain profanity doesn't mean you'll be peppering your conversations tomorrow with four-letter words. But over time, particular lyrics to songs and contents of movies can weaken our defenses, blur our discernment, and reflect and redirect our affections toward the world. Listening to and watching certain entertainment can never be assumed as neutral experiences in our lives because our sinful hearts are involved and we cannot trust our heart. Listen to me, listen to me. The danger in anything related to worldliness is thoughtlessness. Godliness is intentional. It's deliberately saying, have my heart. Have my heart. You know, the motivation is twofold. The motivation is twofold. The grace of God and the face of God. The grace of God. The grace of God. Understanding that the grace of God doesn't make everything a walk in the park, but it does make hard things possible. Yes, it does. And, and understanding the face of God, know, knowing that before we see his face later, we must remember that nothing is hidden by his face now. Hebrews 4.13. How do we deal with it? We say, Lord, work on my heart to make me clean and congruent in this life so that my relationships will be better because you're attentive to what is needed in me more than I'm attentive to what's needed in me. Work in me, Lord. Speaking of golf, uh, the golf legend Bobby Jones, who founded the Masters, is the only player to win 13 majors before he retired at 28 and was the first golfer to win four majors in one year. But even more than his winning record on the golf course, Bobby Jones was a devout follower of Jesus. And he was also famous for his one-stroke penalty at the 1925 U.S. Open. One stroke, I mean, seriously. And th this is a rule in golf that just irritates me. And when I play with some golfers and they say, you touch the ball, bro, that's a swing that counts. Then I don't play with those people anymore. <laughs> but he inadvertently, this was in a tournament, so he inadvertently touched his golf ball and, it, it, and he assessed himself a one-stroke penalty, but no one else saw him touch the ball. Not the tournament official, not even his playing partner. Neither of them actually believed him when he said that he touched the ball. Bobby Jones could have easily just justified it because nobody saw it. But the tournament official said, Bobby, it's up to you. you you're saying you touched the ball. If you touched it, then we'll, we'll, we'll give you another stroke. And, and he, he said, I know I touched it. And he assessed himself a one-stroke penalty, and he lost the 1925 U.S. Open by one stroke. And afterwards, the reporters came and said, we want to do a story on this. He said, you're not doing a story on this. This is not a story worth writing about. I touched the ball. I lost the U.S. Open. 
You see, Bobby could have compromised his integrity and won the match, adding another one to his career. But instead, he chose to lose the match and keep his integrity. There are going to be opportunities for you to live this life and then this life. But the gospel says, why wear yourself out? Live this life. Empowered by my spirit to live it out in victory. All you've got to do is give me that thing on the inside of you and let me work on it every day of your life. And if you do, you're going to see all the rewards that await you on the other side of time. Do you believe that? Let's stand together. Father, we thank you today for the power of your word and how it's transforming us to understand today that we're in need of nothing <laughs> if we allow you to make us pure in heart making us clean and congruent in this life. And we'll ask, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would do a work in us today that no man or woman or force or program or three-step initiative can do in our life. Work in our hearts. And we ask you for that, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed. You've walked into this place today and you're faced with the reality that you're not following Jesus. Today, I encourage you just to come into a new reality of what it means to be free, of what it means to let God not be your judge, but your father in the person of Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. If you will put your trust in Jesus, he will change your life, put you on a different path, surround you with a family that will help you all the days of your life. What a deal. We thank you for that today, Lord. When I count to three, if you've stepped away from God or you're not following Jesus, I want you just to lift your hand and give us an opportunity to pray with you today, all right? So when I count to three, if that's you, you know who you are. I want you to lift your hand, and then we'll pray with you further, all right? One, two, three. If that's you, just lift up your hand right where you are. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, for all of those who are responding, just pray this prayer out loud. Everybody's going to pray it out loud. Come on, join in. Everybody pray it out. Dear God in heaven, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sins. Forgive me, Lord. Make me a new person. I confess Jesus is Lord. I believe you raised him from the dead. I receive my rescue. I receive my salvation. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. We praise you. But we're going to celebrate big around that for all of you who have prayed that prayer and want further help. We're, we've gotten some instruction for you. But I just want to pray a blessing on all of us who are allowing God to work in our hearts. So would you just put your hands out like this and say, here's my life, Lord. Make me what you want me to be. Let me, to be, let me be the person that pleases you. Work in my heart, Lord. Help me to live a life that is congruent with what I confess and let my character match that, Lord. We pray, Father, that you would help us, empower us, enable us to live a life that is a kingdom life, that makes a difference in this darkened world as lights here, Lord. We pray, Father, thank you for your love for us, for your grace. We celebrate all that you're doing in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.
Aren't you thankful for that name, right? Those who have called on the name of the Lord and even those who called on the name of the Lord today to say, yes, I want to follow you. We're celebrating with you. When you say yes to following Jesus, you're also saying yes to community and relationships. So if you prayed that prayer with pastor today, I want to connect with you right over here at our Follow Jesus booth just to give you some resources and let you know you're not in this alone, that we're with you. And in fact, on July 30th during our 1130 gathering, we're going to be celebrating life change through water baptisms. As Pastor today talked about how he's after our heart, Jesus is after our heart. Water baptism is an outward celebration of what Jesus has done in your heart. So if you've never been water baptized or you know somebody who has not, we want to come alongside and encourage you in that, tell you about what it's, what it's about and sign you up for that. You can go to our website. But we are all about life change at Spring Creek, so we celebrate it in a big way. Join us on July 30th for that. Hey, listen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for coming, worshiping, and being a part of the body of Christ. Wednesday night, 6.30 right here, we have something for the whole family. Go be an epicenter of Christ's love. God bless.